I'll just repeat your questions for the recording and then answer them and kind of edit you out. Okay, what's up? Yeah, good question. I don't think we really have the capacity to run two exams, so we're going to put them all at the same time. Uh, it is true it's sooner, and that interrupts people's plans to some extent. But we tried to set it up so there was like a reasonable gap between when we talk about the material and when you're tested on it. Um, so hopefully it'll give you enough time. Yeah, no, I think there were several students who expressed the concern that they would just have fewer days to study if the exam moved up. And um, there were also a lot of students who really wanted to get it over with. I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of things that are unusual already. The fact that we've moved kind of two weeks worth of content out of the course so that the course yeah, is I'm considerably just, uh, less backloaded than it was before, I think makes it, you know, like under under more normal circumstances, it would certainly be doable. I know people are not always able to kind of study as much when they're at home and, and dealing with their families and everything. Um, but, you know, I, I do hope to take that into account when writing the exam. I just don't think it's going to be as as intense an exam experience this time around as either the midterms or past finals. I think it should just be like, you learn the material and then you solve some problems, um, but they'll probably be a little bit less involved than usual. And I think it'll be okay. I'd say like, um, for anyone who either prepared for midterm two or reviewed midterm two after it happened, um, there really isn't that much more material at all. Because there's, scheme which was kind of like one lecture's worth there's a little bit on interpreters but not much sequel you know you have to learn it but it doesn't involve as much problem solving it's more about understanding the kind of semantics of the language and how it works and then it's usually pretty straightforward how to get stuff done with it so right so most of the course is leading up to midterm two and that's why that's like you know two-thirds of the final exam um and yeah, I mean, some students have prepared for that kind of material a lot, and some haven't. Um, but if you if you know that part of the course well, then you're already in good shape. I think there's like lots of time before the exam for that part. And for the new stuff, like it might feel new now because it really is. But uh, I think after some labs and discussions and homeworks and the project, uh, even Scheme and SQL probably will not feel that unfamiliar. Well, uh, did we cut the semester half a month short? We certainly cut two weeks worth of stuff out of this course. And the question is, do we kind of like spread the rest over the same time period? Or do we cut two weeks off of the end? And I wasn't sure what to do. I asked the students, talked about it with the staff. It seemed like there were pros and cons both ways. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a tough time out there and a lot of people want this semester to end. And that seems like a reasonable thing for them to want, considering how much has changed. So, uh, yeah. So here's one more thing that changed along the way, I guess, in this crazy world. But I, I mean, I, I acknowledge it's not perfect for everybody, and it's certainly not something that everybody wanted. Um, and uh, it wasn't the originally stated plan. And uh, it's pretty rare that I change originally stated plans, but it's pretty unusual circumstances. So the question is, can you, in Scheme, write an if where if the predicate's true, then multiple things happen. Like maybe you want to draw a line and then turn and then draw another line. If you were to draw a line and then turn and then draw another line, that wouldn't work out because the if expression would interpret this as the consequent that you do when it's true, and this is the alternative when you do when it's false, and that's not what you want. You want to do all of these things. So there's a special form called begin, which just says evaluate all of the sub expressions, and then the value of the whole begin is the value of the last one. So if you wanted to do that if it's true, and uh, print high if it's false, you would write it like that. I don't know if Zoom managed to show you the drawing, but it 
drew a line and then a turn and then another line. Okay, so the question is, how does evaluation work with a lambda expression and calling a lambda procedure? And uh, here is, I think, the example. I don't know if you can see. Mm -hmm. Oh, you can. Okay. Yes. Um, so this was call y on x and z was the procedure. And then if I wanted to call that lambda procedure on something else, then I would have it in the operator position of a call expression. And mm -hmm. then I would add the uh, operand expressions to get the arguments. So one divided by two would assign x to one, y to the procedure that divides, and z to the number two. And then I would call the procedure that divides on one and two and get a half. Okay, yeah, I think this is right, is that what happens when you quote a forward slash is extremely similar to when you quote the letter A. Now all of a sudden you have a symbol as a value. That symbol uh -huh. doesn't always mean anything in particular. It, it can be evaluated and therefore have a value in the current environment. In the global environment that's built in by default, this forward slash symbol has a value, which is the procedure that divides. A has no value at the beginning. The quoted forward slash, which is a symbol, and you evaluate that symbol, then you get a procedure, the one that's bound to that symbol. Because evaluating a symbol always just looks it up in the environment, and it's going to give you whatever it's bound to or an error. Uh, Can we say that? Yeah, so the question is how many, what's getting evaluated and how many times. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this expression, which is equivalent to this expression, I could have written it either way. This expression is being evaluated once because it's part of a call expression in the operand position and operands always get evaluated. So that first evaluation gives you back a symbol. Then we evaluate that symbol because that's what the eval procedure does. And so that's a second evaluation. So yeah, I think it's a good description to say this expression is being evaluated and then its result is being evaluated. So it's kind of like it's being evaluated twice. Once I see. because uh -huh. whenever you type in an expression, it's gonna get evaluated and the other because we explicitly said do it a second time. Just like for the recording, I'm gonna restate some of the things you said. What would happen if I wrote this with slash quoted now what's going to happen is that y will get bound to the symbol slash as opposed to a procedure that divides. The rule of call expressions is that the operator sub expression must evaluate to a procedure, otherwise you're gonna get an error. If it evaluates to a number, that's bad. If it evaluates to a symbol, that's bad. If it evaluates to a list, that's bad. None of these things can be called on arguments. And so that's the problem that we'll get here. I guess the error says stir is not callable. It should really say symbol is not callable. That's not a very good uh, error message, but it is what it is. So um, yeah, what happened there is that we defined y to be the symbol. And even though you can write that, what happens here is that the symbol gets evaluated. If I write that, y gets evaluated, but what gets back through that process of evaluation is not the symbol. It is the symbol, which is not what you want. What you want is a procedure. And why it is not bound to a procedure, it's bound to a symbol. So I'd have to write okay. something like uh -huh. eval of y, and then use that, and then I could divide. Any questions about SQL? Yeah, so um, the order of evaluation in a SQL query is hard to understand because um, it's not a like, straightforward imperative or procedural language. So you might wonder like, what part of this expression is getting evaluated first? Well, that part turns out to be easy. It's like whatever table you're processing in the from clause, that happens first. But then what happens next? Like, is it the, um, is it the where, or is it the group by, or is it the select part? Well, 
Um, surprisingly, it turns out that if you define a name in any of these parts, then you can use it in the other parts. Um, meaning that's sort of just not obvious like what order things are happening in. And um, uh, uh, SQL evaluator will choose an order of evaluating the sub expressions that makes it work. Um, and yeah, that's like, um, that's very different than a language like Scheme or Python, where there's simple rules that you can describe exactly what order everything happens in. Um, so let me give you an example. Mm -hmm. You might think if you had a create table in as select one as n union select two. And then you write a select statement and you're coming from ints. Mm -hmm. um, a natural way to think about it is you go through all of the integers, you filter based on whatever's in the where clause, and then you compute the result for each row based on whatever is left over. So you could say something like where uh, n is greater than one, I want to see uh, n plus two. But mm -hmm. it turns out that if you give this thing a name, mm -hmm. you could use that name here. So what, what seems so natural, which is like do this part and then do this part and then do this part, can't be what's happening because somehow um, this part is referring to what's happening in here. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I mean, all database query engines differ a little bit in exactly how they work, but um, B is known kind of early on in the evaluation process as a reference to this expression. And therefore um, kind of you can use this expression which you've given a name to elsewhere in your SQL query and it will work. Yes, it is the case that the output is predictable, even though the order in which the, the parts are computed is not predictable because um, like a database query engine will consider multiple different orders. If you have a where clause and an order by clause and a group clause, it will decide, should I, group first and then filter with where and then sort using the order by or should it order by first and then filter with where like um, sometimes this these questions are really simple um, you know why not filter out the stuff you don't need before you group but sometimes they're not so simple because you're joining multiple tables together and you're filtering them along the way and um, it can be helpful to sort two tables before you join them because the join is more efficient. Um, stuff like this comes into play. So even though there's multiple different ways to compute the result, all those different ways compute the same result. Whether you filter the rows first with the where clause and then you order them, or whether you order them first and then filter them, you get the same output. 